Happy New Year 2019, everybody. As the title suggests, I've been away for the last five weeks or so, off in China, attending a couple of weddings. Unfortunately, internet use is heavily regulated in the PRC, so I was unable to access websites such as YouTube, Google, Facebook, Reddit, Quora, etc. Basically, any website where information can be freely passed between people. Apparently, they're a threat to the Chinese Communist Party. News websites such as the ABC and the BBC are also strictly off limits, so I wasn't easily able to access Australian news either. Consequently, this is the first video I've posted in over a month. So regarding internet censorship, does the average Chinese person care? The answer is a resounding no. They are blissfully unaware of the existence of all of these potentially anti-Chinese government websites. But that doesn't mean they go without. The Chinese internet has its own version of all the major websites which most of the population use. The heavily regulated Baidu is the search engine of choice. Good luck finding any meaningful results, however. While I was in China, I used Microsoft's Bing search engine. As expected, it's been heavily filtered to suit the Chinese government, so it wasn't much better than Baidu. Almost every Chinese person I've seen uses the ubiquitous WeChat. China's answer to WhatsApp slash Messenger slash PayPal, all mixed into one. It's by far the most common way people use to communicate with each other. Mobile data is super cheap in China. People happily make video calls from their cars to ask their husbands to pick up some dumplings for dinner. Videos of grandchildren skiing on the mountains are immediately shared with grandparents sitting at home in their living rooms. WeChat has pretty much become an integral part of the Chinese economy. We WeChat is China. So after having lived in China and visiting it over the last few years, I've concluded that the Chinese people see themselves as free. They have access to all these wonderful technologies and can communicate to anybody in the world as long as the other person uses WeChat. They don't know that they can't access the BBC website. They probably don't even know about the BBC website. The Chinese Communist Party have played their cards well. They realise they can't just take stuff from people. They have to give something back too. And they have. They've given the Chinese populace the tools to create a thriving economy without the feeling of being oppressed or hard done by. It's North Korea, but where the people have access to lots of food, technology and a nice apartment. Alcohol is cheap. Cigarettes are cheap. Food is plentiful. There's no signs of political oppression taking place to the average Chinese person. They are free to talk to their friends and family from all over the country as long as political debate is kept low-key and out of the public eye. Public complaints about the government are not welcome. Most of the Chinese I've met either have little interest in politics and are just happy to get on with their lives, or openly praise the current leadership. They see Xi Jinping as taking China in a good direction. Certainly, most Chinese have a positive outlook for China. China. There are no feelings of resentment towards the current regime. As long as most people see their lives improving on a yearly basis, they are happy with whoever is in control. As long as their kids have access to schooling and food and new clothes, they're happy. So back to the weddings. We had to travel all the way to the northern plains of Inner Mongolia to attend a wedding between my Chinese brother-in-law and his Mongolian bride. We first travelled for almost 24 hours on an overnight sleeper train from my wife's city in northeastern China to the closest major city in the western part of Inner Mongolia. From there, we were met by our Mongolian family in two four-wheel drives, who then drove for about three or four hours to the nearest small town to the family farm. That's where we stayed for a few nights in one of the local hotels and where the Mongolian wedding was to take place. The wedding was pretty amazing. Everyone dressed up in traditional Mongolian garb. The Mongolian people were very polite and very hospitable. Despite the rumours, they actually do eat a lot of vegetables, so as a vegetarian, I was able to eat a lot of the food. Admittedly, a lot of the food had sheep's milk in it, but still, it was okay. Typical dishes included bean sprouts, cucumber slices, Swedish cereal mixes, tofu, although I've been told that the tofu was made using sheep's milk as well. Broccoli, cabbage, etc. Actually, all things considered, they ate really healthily. 
Of course, sheep was a big part of their diet. We were served up a freshly slaughtered and roasted sheep's carcass. It's a very polite way to greet travellers. So while I was eating my broccoli and bean curd, there was a dead sheep's head sitting right in front of me on the table. But it was fine, it honestly didn't faze me. From that town, we had to drive a further 50 kilometres across barren countryside to reach the actual family farm. In the winter, the land can't really be used for very much, because most of the grass has died off. However, the government have found a good way to use the land. They've placed tons of wind turbines across the landscape. I found out later that owners of the land actually get a small stipend from the government every month for having turbines on their land. I don't think they get much of a say in the matter, but they do welcome the ongoing revenue. The farmhouse was only quite small, but out the front they had a nice red yurt. Despite the temperatures being below minus 20 degrees centigrade, it was actually quite pleasant outside. It's probably due to it being a very dry cold. There was almost no water or ice to be seen. As long as they had their coats on, my children were happy running around and playing outside for most of the day. The sunshine on their backs and the freely roaming sheep were enough to keep them happy. On the farm, they had sheep and horses. Before I arrived, I imagined that all the animals would be permanently stabled throughout the winter, but that simply wasn't true. The horses were out running around during the sunny days, and the sheep were out wandering around the base of the wind turbines grazing on the small amounts of grass they could find. All the animals seemed quite happy and content. As dusk approached, the family would round up all the animals just using a mixture of whistles and yells. It literally only took them about two minutes to have all the horses and sheep in their pens. I think the animals realised that at night time, it's nicer inside their pens than out. Or perhaps they just know that they'll be given some hay. Anyway, the Mongolian trip was nice. We managed to see a few of the sights, but it was time to head back to northeastern China for the Chinese version of the wedding. As expected, the Chinese wedding was very showy. Lots of music and flashing lights. A professional MC saying all the right things. Lots of guests drinking baiju and beer. It didn't last long. It was all over by lunchtime. Soon after the wedding, we got the unfortunate news that my wife's grandmother had died. It wasn't too much of a shock, however. She was 99. I didn't fully understand the cultural practices, but it went something like this. Two pavilion tents were set up outside the grandmother's house for three days after her death. One contained a temporary shrine, and the other housed the body, although I'm not 100% sure as I was never allowed to enter the second tent. I was allowed to enter the first tent containing the shrine, but only after having dressed up in white robes. There was a whole ritual to it. Because I was a husband of the daughter of one of the grandmother's sons, I had to wear the robes in a particular way. I had to wear a white cloth belt with two ties and a red ribbon tied around one. The length was important. The position of the ribbon was important. I also had to wear a red ribbon around my right wrist. Every other family member was dressed differently based on their position in the family. Some were wearing white hats and white hoods. It was very reminiscent of the Ku Klux Klan. When they asked me if I had seen clothes like these before, I just mentioned only in America. Despite my best efforts to describe the Ku Klux Klan, nobody seemed to know what I was talking about. Anyway, I asked if I could take any photos, even of myself but all photos were strictly forbidden. Something to do with capturing evil spirits. For being an atheist country, they still seem to have an unsettled belief in the supernatural. I went inside the first tent with the funeral director close by. He wanted to make sure I was doing everything correctly. I had to bow my head three times at the shrine, then I had to kneel down and do three deep bows. Then, because of my position in the family, I had to go to the back of the tent and watch others do the same. I just went along with it all as I didn't want to offend anybody. We then all jumped in a team of white vehicles and headed towards what I now know to be the crematorium. The crematorium was about 50 kilometres out of town and was a massive government-run facility. I was told that all funerals are handled by the government now, because there was too many discrepancies across the country. Some minorities apparently sent their dead bodies floating down rivers as part of their funeral ceremonies, so I guess the PRC stepped in and decided to standardise the whole process. And it was standardised. Every part of the process was the same for all families that I saw. The first thing that I noticed as I walked into the crematorium was the presence of a police SWAT team. I asked my family members if something had happened, but they just said that it's normal and not to worry. I asked why would they need a SWAT team at a crematorium, and the only answer I received was that sometimes people go crazy. 
Okay, I imagined a grieving widow pulling out a glock from under her white robes and shooting the whole place up. Personally, I just think that because the facility was government run and operated, and it was a long way out of town, it was only natural for the PRC to have a standing police presence. Either way, nobody batted an eyelid. We went down to the basement where we entered the morgue. They wheeled out the grandmother on a small metal gurney. They put her in a large paper tray and everyone gathered around in a circle. The funeral director was shouting commands, none of which I understood, but everyone seemed to be following his orders. They put money in the grandmother's pockets, as apparently she will need some Chinese yuan in the afterlife. My thought was, if the afterlife is eternal, will any amount of money be enough? Next, all the family members were instructed to fill the paper tray that housed the grandmother with paper flowers and drops of water. As this was going on, I was watching two other bodies undergoing the same rituals. After the tray was full, almost as if upon command, everybody started weeping. Mother! Mother! Why did you leave us? Here's some water, Mother, so that you don't get thirsty. For about two minutes, people just wept uncontrollably. From that point, the grandmother was wheeled out and we went back upstairs to the next building. We were met with the grandmother surrounded by flowers in a special ceremonial room. There was a young government employee standing there with a microphone and a prepared speech. He read it out and we had to circle the body in a particular family order. I was last, of course. Apparently husbands of granddaughters aren't very important. From that point, the funeral director announced that this would be the last time the family members see the grandmother before the cremation. Everyone started weeping uncontrollably again. We were ushered out and the grandmother was quickly wheeled off by a couple of government employees. Next, we were taken to the next building into a room full of metal boxes. I thought, okay, maybe this is where the ashes come out. The funeral director asked the men of the family to head into the next room. I wasn't allowed to go. They came back five minutes later with two metal barbecue trays. One contained bones, the other contained a broken skull. I thought, okay, ashes are not the important part here. They like bones. I started thinking to myself, do bones not get burnt in the incinerator? As far as I'm aware in Australia, solid bones are never present in the ashes. But then again, maybe they process them before giving them to the families. So anyway, they plonked these two metal trays down in front of the family on top of the steel boxes. The funeral director put his hands in and started sifting through the remains, removing particular parts. He didn't seem to be concerned about touching the recently burnt grandmother. So I began to think, is this really her? It all seemed to happen too quickly. I looked over my shoulder at another family and they came out with the same metal barbecue trays with very similar looking bones. Was every family just being given the same default ash-covered bones? Who would know in China? The family then had to each choose a bone to put into a ceremonial box. My wife had to pick one up and put it into the box. Once the box was full, the bones were covered in a ceremonial cloth and the grandmother's false teeth were laid on top. Apparently spirits can't eat in the afterlife unless they bring their earthly dentures with them. The box was then transported to another building where it was laid to rest in a large mausoleum. But I was told that it was only a temporary resting place. Three months later, it would be moved to the family mausoleum in a nearby mountain. As we left the building, we were told to start stripping off our white robes and to not look back. My wife and I had to hold our robes together and place them in the bin. It seemed such a waste. They were quite nice robes. And that's it. That was a Chinese funeral as seen through the eyes of a Westerner. I know, I wasn't privy to all information, but I came pretty close. I was a bit skeptical of a few parts of the process, not because of the supernatural, but because of certain things like putting wads of money on the corpse. I was concerned that the people in the cremation chamber just take all the money before they burn the body. Surely, as government employees, they wouldn't allow the burning of legal tender. So my Chinese trip was very interesting, but I've certainly had enough. Although the Chinese don't know that they don't have access to international news, it certainly affected me. Five weeks in China was definitely enough. The internet has become a lot worse than I remember it. Xi Jinping is cracking down, but in such a way that the average Chinese citizen doesn't know and just doesn't care. They have their cell phones, they have their WeChat, they have their plentiful food and their caffeine and their nicotine and their alcohol. They're content in their state-controlled dictatorship because it just doesn't feel like one. 
And now that I'm back in the world of the free and can access all the other problems of the world, sometimes I can understand why China is the way it is. Ignorance, sometimes, is bliss.